tardes. Eh, esta tarde tenemos una conferencia con el, el doctor Sami Zamni de la Universidad de Ghent de Bélgica. Eh, la conferencia será en inglés. Uh, uh, presentaré a Semni, que es, un profesor, uh, es profesor uh, espe especializado más en, en uh, Oriente Medio y Norte de África. Su, uh, en esta conferencia hablará sobre comercio, seguridad y, y las políticas neoliberales en Norte de África. Él se ha centrado mucho sobre Marruecos, uh, uh, Túnez y Egipto, pero uh, el, nos hablará sobre las políticas públicas eh, después de la primavera árabe. Eh, tendrá una hora eh, para hablar y después a, a abrimos una ronda de intervenciones para preguntas y discusiones. Eh, señor Semi, gracias. Welcome. Gracias. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Good evening. Good afternoon. Um, alas. I cannot do this uh, presentation in Spanish or in Catalan, so um, therefore I'm going to do it in English. First of all, I would like to thank the Institute, uh, European Institute for the Mediterranean, and especially Laura and Elisabetta for uh, inviting me and having me, and also for the very nice organization to give me the opportunity to come for the first time to Barcelona. <laughs> um, As my colleague Rashid just said, the title of this presentation is Trade, Security, and Neoliberal Politics, Wither Arab Reform, Question Mark, North Africa After the Uprisings. Now, I've chosen this title because it's basically this, uh, the title of an article that I wrote in 2008 and published in 2009 with my colleague and friend who was then my PhD student, Kunrad Bogart, and who is now already a professor on his own. Um, a, a paper that focused on these issues, trade, security, and neoliberal politics, especially on mm, the Moroccan case. Now, today I'm going to talk more about trade and neoliberal uh, politics more than I will talk about security, even though it's very important, and we might come back to that in the Q&A. Now, when I was thinking of pre preparing for this uh, lecture, um, I have been doing these quite a few times over the last couple of years, but I wanted to do something different, something new. So I went back to that old uh, 2009 article And um, I want to begin with some quotes from that article. And I'm just going to read very quickly. Contrary to the dominant discourses, the introduction of neoliberal capitalism does not bring forth overall economic growth and prosperity, which will lead to political liberalization. Instead, these political reforms create a specific geographical landscape in which some places, territories, and scales are systematically privileged over and against others, inducing uneven geographical developments that do not trigger incentives for democratic accountability. The scope of these manifestations, and we were referring to the movement and wave of protest that was already then, in the late 2000s present, is now widening. And although the forms of protest were based on a broad public sympathy, they are still small local initiatives. Nevertheless, it's too early to predict the overall impact of these manifestations. And just to jump to the last one, therefore, it is likely that in the future in Morocco, but also in neighboring countries, neoliberal reform will enhance instability as it is widening the economic cleavage between the rich and the poor. This, in turn, can result in turmoil, triggering authoritarian reactions and repression by the governments or leaders. Now, obviously, this was published in 2009, like I already said. This is not at all uh, a sign to say that Kuhn and I predicted somehow uh, the Arab uprisings. That was not the point at all. But uh, a more depressing fact is that it doesn't take a lot of imagination to understand that these quotes can be used for the same article written today 10 years later. We could end an article uh, coming up with, with these lines. That's actually very sad because we did have a lot of political change and in some countries in the region, major political turmoil, like for example in Tunisia 
uh, with uh, the revolution of 2011. So the question at hand is, today, after the wave of revolts, social protests and popular mobilizations are still continuing and are even growing. And obviously, um, I will focus mainly on Morocco and Tunisia, the two countries that I know best. The situation in the Middle East is quite different, even though uh, for countries like Lebanon, Jordan, uh, and even Egypt, even though there's a harsher repressive uh, authoritarianism with General el-Sisi in power, um, we see some um, parallels and same patterns of mobilizations. Now, first of all, um, I am a professor in social and political sciences, but I'm not in international politics. I am part of a department that is called the Conflict and Development Research Group, and we are basically what you could call some sort of political uh, ethnographers. We go into the field. So we study these larger issues of uh, reforms or neoliberal development in the field. So I will not focus my lecture tonight on um, the the international side of these things, like the very concrete programs that exist of the international community or the European Union, or the specific programs that are being implemented by the international financial institutions, but we'll look at it from the other side, from what's happening in the field, what's happening on the ground. Now, the question at hand is how to explain this continuation of a lot of social protest of collective mobilizations. What is um, the cause, basically, of uh, these uh, tendencies? And especially what's interesting is to start with the idea that, OK, in Tunisia in 2011, we had, um, well, let's call it a revolution. We can come back to that and uh, discuss the, the details. Um, but a major political change where the president, Ben Ali, was basically kicked out or pushed to leave the country and a whole new political system was created. Still, Tunisia is today, again, um, confronted with different forms of uh, social protest. In Morocco, the king was able, early 2011, to very quickly diffuse the collective mobilizations that were also present in Morocco, uh, mainly under the umbrella of the 20th February movement. So nothing very much changed in Morocco. Some issues, some political institutions, the constitution, for example, or the formation of a government that was led for the first time by an Islamist political movement. Uh, these were you know, quite important changes, but uh, much um, impressive, much deep, uh, much less deep than in Tunisia. And still, Morocco is also confronted with the same type of mobilizations. How to explain this? Now, there is an easy answer that we sometimes uh, find in um, publications and in discussions and conferences is, uh, I would say, the easy answer, which is not completely wrong, and to say, well, the comparison Tunisia-Morocco, it's not so important whether there has been more or less change because in the end, democratically elected governments may indeed fail to deliver what the people want. So that basically uh, the, the, the question of mobilizations remains the same. Now, as already said, the, uh, the wave of revolts and revolutions and uprisings that we call the Arab uprisings have had many different outcomes, and to a certain extent, I would suggest even that it's still continuing. What we see now uh, in certain parts of Tunisia and Morocco is actually, in my view, a continuation of the same type of um, dynamics that were present also in that 2010-2011 uh, period. So how can we look at these things? And Therefore, you have to go back on how the, the field of Middle East studies was organized prior to uh, the Arab revolutions. The conventional approaches were mostly um, two paradigms. I see them basically as one paradigm, but like the two faces, the two sides of one medal. It's on the one hand the transitology theories, and the other, on the other hand the authoritarian uh, resilience theories. 
In the 1980s, late 1980s, early 1990s, there was a lot of optimism worldwide that democracy was the only viable option for governments uh, to implement and that bit by bit the whole world will move or would move to democratic institutions and with that also uh, a free economic market as an economic organization. And people were, as it is uh, called in the literature, were seen as being democracy spotters. So a lot of researchers uh, went to look through Arab countries to see, you know, uh, where do we see tendencies towards democratization and how can we eventually help them? How can we sustain them? How can we make them stronger? And what are perhaps the obstacles of or for democratization that perhaps we can help of getting rid of these obstacles? But bit by bit in the 90s, it became clear that the token um, reforms that were being implemented here and there were not so much more than window dressing, that it was either uh, small changes that didn't really had a great impact on the political systems that allow in terms of accountability of the governments or participation or fr general freedoms of the citizens. These were small um, changes and a lot of these changes were basically made by these governments and implemented by these governments as an international window dressing to communicate to the rest of the world and to show their benevolence, etc. So from the 90s, uh, early 90s onwards, there was a group of researchers saying, well, you know, that democracy spotting is not the, 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 good, the good way to look at these, uh, the issue of political change in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, instead of looking at democracy, we should look actually on how authoritarianism sustains itself. How does it come that it keeps on reinventing itself? So how does authoritarianism upgrade itself? How does it uh, become so resilient? Huh? How can these uh, systems uh, keep on functioning? So obviously, all these theories have a very big focus, the transitology as well as the authoritarian resilience literature, a focus on regimes a focus on institutions, on elites, on political parties, on elections, let's say the technical side of democracy that of course is very important. We need those in a good working democracy. But perhaps these are not enough. And indeed, with the wave of Arab uprisings, we have uh, read a lot of soul searching and mea culpas of a lot of researchers saying, oh, um, we, looked, we looked at the wrong places, or we missed certain things. Our radar was, um, was set up too high, so we're, we were indeed focusing too much on the regime and the elites, and we were not looking enough to what was underneath it, basically the rest of society, I would say. People were looking at civil society, but that civil society was mainly the well-organized, highly educated groups residing mostly in the capital or in the two or three other big cities in these countries. And in the beginning of, the, of, of these revolts, we saw that there was like a third paradigm coming up, still exists, and I would, you know, to position myself, say that I'm more or less part of that trend, is uh, the paradigm that basically works within the framework of the contentious politics and social movement theory. Now that's a very broad field with a lot of different ways of looking at these things, but at least these are, th this is a paradigm that starts by looking in the field at specific types of collective mobilization and how people organize, how people make movements, how they collectively make claims on the governments, local authorities or national authorities or anything in between. However, after those first few months of, I would say, optimism, we also uh, saw, starting with, uh, with Libya, that the wave of uprisings was not necessarily leading to major political change, but was actually uh, leading to a lot of instability and insecurity. Um, the so-called Arab Spring, a term that I don't really like, very quickly changed into a so-called Arab Winter, the, another concept that I don't particularly like. 
But that was a little bit the idea. And what we saw then is that the field of Middle Eastern studies, um, the area studies, went back to a readjustment of the two former paradigms, namely the transitology and the authoritarian resilience paradigms. And the only thing that changed is that indeed now they would include a little bit more other variables such as the impact of reforms on the lower classes, the organization of civil society that is outside the international civil society that everybody knows, the highly educated, well-connected elites of, the, of these countries. Not that they're doing anything wrong. They are also very important assets for their countries, but they are not the only ones, of course. So there is a little bit of readjustment, a reappraisal of these paradigms, but nothing much has, alas, changed. And the problem that I see with these type of conventional approaches are threefold. And you know, basically, I'm going to uh, use the rest of the time to, um, to point at different issues related to each of these. First of all, all these paradigms still divorce the political from the economic. Um, this is actually quite banal to say that the economic is political and vice versa. It's not only me who says that. It's definitely not only Marxists who say that. It's even uh, Bill Clinton who said it. It's the economy, stupid. Eh? Um, it's really important to understand that the economy and the way it's organized is a consequence not of nature, but of political choices by people who are in certain positions who take these decisions. Now, why they take them, how they take them, that's a complex matter, of course, and that's different matter. And it's one of the issues that is difficult to resolve, and I will come back at that. A second limit, I think, of these conventional approaches is that a lot use the categories on the one hand, regime or state, and on the other hand, the civil society, as if they are completely disconnected. And the one, the state, the regime, is always the bad guy. That's where the locus of authoritarianism is situated. And then you have civil society, and that's very good. There are the tendencies for liberalization, for democratization, for freedom, for opening, etc. This, too, is a little bit more complex in reality than the way it's presented in a lot of these models and a lot of the um, literature on the region. And a third limit is something that everybody acknowledges but still tends to obfuscate the role of international political and economic agencies and institutions on North Africa and mostly because we're talking about Morocco and Tunisia on these countries. So I'm talking uh, the EU, the US, but also the IMF, the World Bank. Now, everybody in the field would, um, would agree with, with the fact that these play an important role. They have an impact on the policies that are being implemented and decided upon in the region. But still, I don't know what the main reason is when push comes to shove, when you read articles, it is acknowledged in one line and then forgotten for the rest of the article so they can focus on the bad regime, that everything resides, or the, the main obstacle for change, democratization, opening, whatever term is used, is the regime always. Now, in that article of 2009, what we wanted to do, and but when I say we, it's also because I'm head of a research group and we're now working with, with uh, a couple of people on, on the same issues in different countries, was the need to contextualize the social mobilizations, protests, revolts, and revolutions in a longer term, in a longer time space, and to focus on 30 years of so-called neoliberal development. Now, I'm not using neoliberalism or neoliberal development here as uh, some sort of scapegoat, nor is it the complet um, of, of the World Bank or the US against the people of the Middle East. It's not at all that. It's just simply the name that I use for the state of capitalism that we live in in the world. And there's very few people, uh, even the people who gather every year at Davos, who would disagree with the fact that neoliberalism, or what is understood underneath it, with its uh, financial and monetary strictness, with its um, typical uh, 
pushing for uh, flexibility, free market reforms, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is you know the current um, state of capitalism in in the world as much as is in, is in Europe, as it is in the rest of the world. However, the rest of the world, and especially the countries that we're talking about, are integrated into that capitalist world system in a specific way. In a way that doesn't allow, as the theory always presumes, a same level, a level playing field. There is, because there is a power imbalance between the two shores of the Mediterranean, you cannot say that these partners are equally competing on the same level. So it was important for us to look at the history of the political economy of these regions and to show also that the economy cannot diverge from the political and vice versa, and that these cannot be diverse from transnational networks that these countries are tied to. So it's a question of scales. Now, I'm not going to go back, of course, into details and, and do the whole history of uh, the region or of Tunisia and Morocco, but I will have to say a few things about that. After independence, there was mostly a state-led economy in North Africa based on a Keynesian reading of uh, the economy. Now, Keynes is a very well-known economic thinker that also had a tremendous impact on post-war Europe. He's basically, as a liberal, the founder of what we today call the social welfare state because he understood that when the conflicts and tensions within a society between rich and poor get too big, so when the middle classes wither away, that you open up the possibility for all kinds of radical ideologies to move in. The idea after World War II was that Nazism and fascism uh, had become a possibility because the, the cleavage between rich and poor had become too big. And there was a more or less consensus in Europe about this analysis. So very quickly, in Europe, they started implementing the economies or political economic systems where the workers and um, those the businessmen basically would come together and discuss these things. So you have this what they call in Dutch overleg uh, overleg economy, an economy of dialogue, basically, which you know eventually opened up the possi possibility of a welfare state. Now this happened in Europe in the 50s, bit by bit, and then in the 60s, the, you know, which was an incredible decade of growth in, in Europe, which made, uh, or which made it possible that the welfare state um, became um, you know, well-funded, basically. But when you look at North Africa, especially in Tunisia, for example, after the first few years of um, hesitation of Bourguiba, he, I think he wanted to implement some sort of liberal economy, but that didn't work because the local bourgeoisie was too weak. He also switched to a more socialist-inspired um, um, period of economic development in the 60s. It has nothing to do with socialism as such in an ideology. Bourguiba many times uh, said that there was no such thing as class struggle. It's difficult to be a socialist and say that class struggle is not the, the motor of, uh, of the historical uh, uh, progress and evolution. And, and many other you know, things he said showed that he, he, inspired, he was inspired in part by uh, socialist ideas, but it was not socialism at all. It was still a very much state-led capitalism, controlled type of capitalism. Now, the important thing there is that, in a way, he also told or gave the people the idea that Tunisia was moving towards a welfare state. And I think it's, this is important. Obviously, Tunisia was never rich enough to implement the same levels of welfare as we have known, and I say that in the past, as in Europe during the 60s and the 70s and 80s. 
But the idea was there. And the people, for a large part, have in, interiorated, eh, interiorized, sorry, these ideas. And we'll come back to that later, because it, it says something about the political economy of a part of the social protest that is going on today. A very high demand of the, for the state to intervene. Morocco, from the beginning, went for a more liberal type of development, but also there, it was, up until the 70s, mainly state-controlled, very well um, uh, controlled by uh, the Moroccan state. Again, with the same, there, there was some parallel with Tunisia. But then in the 70s, because the economy didn't grow as these countries expected, they switched to forms of partial liberalization. So long before the 80s, where really these countries knocked on the door of the International um, uh, Monetary Fund and of the World Bank, they all already started to implement some economically liberalizing measures, both in Tunisia and Morocco. And in that period, the state still played a very important role. It switched, basically, from a more collective, planned organization type of economy, socialist-inspired, let's say, in Tunisia, towards a more liberal type of development, but uh, with a larger role and part played by um, the free market and private uh, agencies. Even that didn't really work out for the uh, North African governments. There was growth, but not enough. And not, not enough meant that uh, the economic growth could not uh, hold the pace of the demographic evolution of the country. A lot of these countries have known a demographic transition, like all countries in the world have had. Most of European countries had it in the beginning of the 20th century, like a boom in population when the mortality rate starts declining and the birth rate is still high. It's only after one or two generations that people start to realize we don't have to make that much kids anymore because they don't die anymore. So then the birth rate drops and then uh, you have stabilization of uh, your demography. So for the North African countries with a lot of youngsters coming on the job market already in the 70s and, and early 80s, it was obvious that these economies could not deliver the jobs. And they can't still today because that's one of the big issues um, in the two countries. So both countries felt the need to call in help, basically, and knocked on the doors, like I said, of the international financial institutions, and structural adjustment plans were bit by bit introduced. And we saw there, both countries, Morocco and Tunisia, that from the 80s onwards, but very slowly, this didn't go overnight, it was not a, a shock therapy kind of uh, policy, but a very gradual one, where the state would withdraw more and more from its economic role as it used to play in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And what the people would see was not free market that would benefit for all. There was growth. The structural adjustment plans have actually um, generated quite substantial percentages every year of growth for Tunisia and Morocco. But that growth did not result in general prosperity. There were less and less redistributive measures taken for the people, etc. So what people felt, and to a large degree they were right, was that the economic growth was going to very few people, those who were well connected, those who had ties to the regime, those who were allowed to be economically active and to make money out of it. And this was tied also to politics, of course. It's still, or sorry, in Tunisia it has changed, but it was the president and people around him who would decide who would get an authorization to do a certain kind of business or not. And in Morocco, it's not that much different. And there, on top of that, you have a king who has, since the 1990s, and especially the, the king who is now on the throne, uh, who's basically the number one businessman of the country. Um, Numbers are secret, and perhaps Rashid can you know, agree or disagree on the number, but the last time I was in Morocco last month, some people told me that 
the, the king and his family must control more or less, he himself, 40% of the Moroccan uh, economy. Mm. Because he has stakes in basically every major industry or investment or developmental plan. Now for the people, of course, you get then these, they see other stuff. They don't see the free market. They see the Wild West, they see corruption, they see crony capitalism, that means capitalism that is only beneficial for certain people, for certain groups who are allowed to make money out of the uh, possibilities that exist. But in reality, the consequences were a complete breakdown of the so-called social contract. And I put that between quotation marks because there was never a social contract written between the regime, the government, and the population, of course. But it's that kind of thing that I was referring to when I said they wanted to implement the idea of a welfare state, but because they weren't rich enough to really organize it like we have known it in Europe in the 60s and 70s and 80s, the people still awaited things from the government. And the social contract was something like, as long as we work at school, so the idea of meritocracy, we're entitled to a good job. And with that good job, we can have a decent life. We're not asking for more here. So our part is we study well, we study hard, and then we work hard. And the part of the government is to provide us with a decent job. This completely disappeared, of course, in a situation where the free market, and especially the private sector, should create the jobs that the people want. But alas, the private sector was not able to create that much jobs. The demand is much, much bigger. So there is massive unemployment, and especially youth employment, youth unemployment, and especially within that category, the highly educated youth. Because contrary to certain ideas that North African countries never invested in um, public education, for example, well, the results are flawed and in, 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 in contextual in each country, but a country like Tunisia, in terms of investment in education, had quite substantial budgets for a long period of time and had for a long time quite a good educational system. But then what do you do with all these peoples with masters and letters, even with doctors? Okay, in Tunisia there's always need for doctors, but just look at the map of Tunisia, and I think it, it, um, it exists on the website of the Ministry of Public Health. All these people tend to locate themselves, obviously, in the richer areas where people have the money to go and see the doctor. And it's incredible how few of these many, many doctors go live in areas where there is a much bigger need uh, for, um, for doctors. So there, too, you have these uneven uh, geographical um, consequences of certain types of development. So economic growth was for the few, and we saw more and more an uneven geographical development, and that's really important. And, we, you know, it became very obvious after or during the wave of revolts that, for example, the tension between the so-called Maroc utile, the useful Morocco, and inutile, and the not useful uh, Morocco, or what in Tunisia they would refer to les deux Tunisies, the two Tunisias, like the, the richer, more developed coastal areas, and especially the big cities like Tunis, Sous, and Sfax, and then the interior of the country that was uh, that remained largely marginalized. Well, in the case of Tunisia, we can say that revolution started in that marginalized area. It's not a coincidence. And still today, most of the opposition, most of the collective mobilizations that go against these policies are situated in the marginalized areas of the country. And with that came thus what uh, the uh, geographer uh, David Harvey calls accumulation by dispossession. In both countries, we had, and we still have, and we'll come back to that, of course, in, in a couple of minutes, the idea that there's no other choice than uh, the development that the government is choosing for, that is, let's say, um, to put it short for now, the neoliberal um, agenda of uh, the international financial institutions. 
And this, as a consequence, shows that there are winners and losers. And obviously, the, these governments know that. Even Ben Ali knew that very well. In the late 2000s, he had year after year launched programs of social development, of youth funds, of helping to uh, back the marginalized areas to get them on par with the rest of the country, etc. So they knew that, that there was a lot of tensions. But they thought that with small programs here and there, they could eradicate the pockets of poverty and bring development like in Tunis, like in Sfax, like in Sousse, to the whole of the country. Now, I do think that that's a miscalculation. Uh, one uh, quote that I didn't read from the, from, from the second slide from the article was the following. It is important to acknowledge that this opposition is not because of their inclusion, their exclusion from global projects of development or the free market, but because of their differential integration into it. Now, what do we mean by that? And I still stand behind that uh, analysis, and I just, yeah, I will, I will come back to it in a, in, a, in a minute, is that these marginalized areas, it's not that it's desert, and even in the desert, there's very beautiful things, and there are a lot of resources. The center, whether that center is located on the shores, on the coastal areas, or somewhere else where the heavy economic development is, the center drains the resources of these marginalized areas. The phosphate of the interior of Tunisia, the agricultural products of the interior of Tunisia, more or less the same kind of things in Morocco, are all gotten in these marginalized areas, but they do not benefit from them. They are taken away and then they are refined, reworked, industrialized, something is done with it or just basically exported in the rich areas. Even you could say that the human resources of these people are also drained in the sense that for certain uh, months a year, for example, when the tourism sector was doing well, that a lot of people from the interior would migrate for three, four months during the high season of tourism to the coastal areas to change from their agricultural status in, um, in the interior to become some sort of guide or camel guide uh, person uh, during the summer to win some money. Now, these tensions between the marginalized areas and the more developed areas has also proven that authoritarian rule in these countries had to become more repressive. Because even then, in the 90s and 2000s, it was obvious that a lot of people were not happy with the way it was organized. So people started whenever they could, and you know, very bit by bit, trying to look for the limits, what could be said or what could be done in terms of opposition, in terms of claim making. And because of the sheer amount of claims that were coming to the governments, we saw that, for example, in Tunisia, repression became harder. So the, the, the authoritarian political organization is tied to the economic hardship of certain people and vice versa. So there is a linkage there. Now, that were the 90s and the 2000s. Did that change after 2010, 11, 12, and uh, in the wave of Arab uprisings? And I will not focus, of course, on that period. Well, the first thing that we could raise as a question is, when you live, like in Tunisia, through this revolution, whatever the main cause is, at least you should, as a government, ask the question, OK, what did we do before that led the people to come into the street that much and basically overthrow the president and his government? What were the causes? Now, everybody was pointing. And I remember when I was going back in, in 11 and in 12, everybody was pointing at most of the time, the economic organization. When people, when I asked them what for them was the most important, it was very simple. It was jobs, jobs, jobs. When I came back in 2014, 2015, it was jobs, jobs, security, and jobs. 
because then indeed with certain attacks and this and that and ISIS and so on, things had changed by then. And still today when I go back, it's about jobs, it's about development, it's about the economy. It's less about political freedoms, even though they are very important and they do make a difference um, when you compare the two countries. Now the governments themselves, they asked also the question, why did reforms bring forth such negative outcomes? But alas, as early as May 2011, so that means that, okay, Mubarak had fallen, Ben Ali had fallen, uh, Libya was in turmoil, in Morocco there was mobilizations, in Algeria too, but in May 2011, uh, the G8 meeting in Deauville, in France, already set the agenda for the next, next decade, I would say. There, they basically said the same thing as 10 years ago and as 20 years ago. They didn't say there was something wrong in our plans. There was something wrong in the ideas we had about how to organize these economic reforms. No, they basically said, well, it's wrong policies of implementation. The governments, like Morocco or Tunisia, did not do their job as well as we thought. Even though we have proof of that, both countries, Tunisia and Morocco, and I would add Egypt to that, have been in 2006, 7, 8, 9, seen as one of the best pupils of the World Bank. And they were, uh, they, they got grants for that, and there's reports showing that, you can read all that, it's all online where they basically say, well, you're doing everything as you should. You're doing fine. But then a couple of years later, they come back to that and they basically say, well, you know, you, you didn't do that great of a job. But we, international community, World Bank, IMF, we have done nothing wrong. We have no responsibility in what happened. It's all your fault. So it's a question of planning and implementation. And that's really sad to see, but because there were alternatives. And I'm not saying that I have the solution, that I know what would exactly work. But I do know that what we have been implementing for the last 20 years, and since the Arab Revolution is basically the same, is not working at all. So at least let us try to think about certain alternatives. One type of alternative was uh, voiced by the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, uh, very well present in North Africa, and uh, especially in Tunisia and Morocco, who advocated for a return of the old classic developmental state, basically upgraded to the 21st century, of course, but a state that would be much more um, prominent in uh, reorganizing the economy along Keynesian rules. And, and also the International Labour Organization was behind that idea. Another type of um, alternative that was proposed, even though less so for North Africa, but at least for Egypt, there was more talk about it, is to use a little bit the model of the South, Afri South Asian tigers and go for um, a very um, economic liberalization without political liberalization in the first phase and then hope then hope that it would happen afterwards. Although when you look at countries like Singapore, they had terrific economic development. It's one of the top in the world. But can you say that it's really a free country or it knows political liberalization? I don't think so. So I'm not really sure whether that was an alternative. And obviously another form or type or group of alternatives that we could perhaps label as the social democratic alternative what was, was coming from the civil societies within these countries itself, where people would uh, ask for much more participatory forms of economic reorganization, of self-organization and self-help, of rethinking the uh, priorities of economic development, and to start with a crucial area of the economy, and that is the agriculture. I do know that both for Morocco and, and Tunisia, the, the importance of agriculture as opposed to services and industry is shrinking a lot, yes. 
But for a lot of people, and especially in the marginalized areas, agriculture is still the most important way of making any income. Now, Tunisia, as Morocco, has incredibly invested in reorganizing the agriculture into a liberal export-orientated um, agriculture. So an agriculture that's not first and foremost producing for the local markets, for the local needs, but for export, for the rest of the world, basically. Now again, there's nothing wrong with export, there's nothing wrong with having uh, good, fine products of certain countries that you have a comparative advantage in to sell them on the international market. Who wouldn't do that? But there's balances that you can strike here. And that is what most of the people were asking for. That, like in many things, that because of the power imbalances, that a few people, uh, the, the big landlords, have you know, attracted the bulk of agricultural production to them, and a lot of farmers had lost their ancestral lands, have lost their access to land, and became basically day earners, day wagers um, on, on their own fields. So that was another type of alternative that could have been possibly done. And I still, until today, ladies and gentlemen, don't understand why in Tunisia, because of the big changes that happened, and especially in the beginning, that nobody really even tried to implement some sort of different type of agricultural model. There's different hypotheses. Some people tell me that it's mostly because Tunisia is too weak to withstand the pressure of the international financial institutions. I don't believe that. They negotiate every word and every comma and every dot in each, um, in each treaty or pact they make with these institutions. Why couldn't they do that with this, with the agricultural? For example, the IFIs have asked Tunisia and Morocco alike to stop subsidizing basic staples because it's indeed a burden on the budget. In Tunisia, the price of olive oil, sugar, eggs, milk, uh, bread, obviously, and a couple of other things, uh, even cooking gas, is heavily subsidized so that the price is not really the market price, but is a price that is more or less set by the government because it pumps in a lot of money to mitigate the, the otherwise market prices. Now, the IFIs have always asked to remove that, or at least to come up with a plan to cut down bit by bit so that they could disappear over time. And obviously, that would then you know, be mitigated by new taxes and especially value-added taxes, etc. Tunisia have never accepted. Tunisia have never accepted to do that. Yes, there have been little dits and dots that have tried in the budget to, uh, to cut a little bit, but they have never really got rid of that. So my point is, why didn't they try then, also with the agriculture, to organize a system where the people of the marginalized areas who came onto the streets as the first and who fought the government of uh, the RCD of Ben Ali, that, you know, that people could learn from what they, they wanted. They didn't do that. A second hypothesis is that most of the people in the ministries, including the ministers who are in charge of these more technical dossiers, so I'm not talking about defense, security, and internal affairs, but indeed agriculture, transport, economy, finance, budget, and so on, are people who are by and large formed and, and educated in the international system. And a lot of them have indeed uh, PhDs and other diplomas from foreign universities that are mainly uh, uh, given uh, in the US. And you know, uh, some people say they, they have uh, interiorized um, and, and, and taken over basically the same type of ideas than what they have learned in their schools. So I already said what happened during the wave of revolts, of course, in, in both in Tunisia and, um, and in Morocco. And as I have only 10 minutes, to, uh, to end, let me then focus on certain things that I learned over the last few months when I was uh, in the field. 
So what we are witnessing today is that both Morocco and Tunisia are still today implementing more or less the same type of policies that they implemented in the 90s and the 2000s. I think there's ample proof that in the 90s and the 2000s, these reforms had a lot of negative consequences. Then why today are they still doing the same thing? Well, that question leaving aside the why, we could just state that for now, social protests and mobilizations are you know, on the rise. Social protest has become a learning experience. In the 1980s, people sometimes poured into the streets because they were mad with prices that overnight went up, for example, in Tunisia in 84, or in the early 90s in, in Morocco, when uh, the government suddenly decided that the bread would overnight cost the double the day afterwards. People would come into the streets and would riot, basically. But bit by bit, you see that uh, people have learned to organize, have learned to make social movements, to make claims on the governments, and this is of course dependent on the context, and here we do see quite a difference between Morocco and Tunisia. And that's why I have called it from Jemna to Imider, uh, two examples uh, that I've just uh, been there. Um, Jemna is a small oasis in southern Tunisia, um, that has basically everything to have a, a thriving local economy. However, in the 1960s, this little oasis town was set up as one of the cooperative socialist type of uh, ideas, and it never really developed well. And people didn't really understand why. No official evaluations were made, but you know, it was obvious, or at least officially, uh, the oasis and what it was producing uh, was not uh, profitable. People didn't understand why, but then liberalism came in. And then certain people got hold of the lands of the, um, of the oasis and started developing it. And at least officially, again, it wasn't making any money. Then comes the revolution in 2011, and the people just take it over. Within two years, Jamna has become an incredibly lucrative and rich oasis. It had more or less 400 workers in 2011. Before the revolution, it has now more than 1,500. All these people are paid, and they are still making profits. So what are people coming up now as type of analysis is that Obviously, it was making money, but the money was disappearing, that oasis. Otherwise, they cannot explain why now, after the revolution, after two years of self-organization, this is a thriving community. Now, the government doesn't like that, because the people of Gemina basically retook the oasis who had been privatized. So the large landowners who had bought these lands albeit for a very token amount of money because they were friends of the ruling elites. These people want their lands back, so of course, because they have deeds. But the people have settled and have taken over these lands again. Now, because of the revolution in Tunisia, the government can't just go in and you know, push aside the people. And that's a big difference than what's happening in Morocco where authoritarianism and authoritarian reflexes are still pretty much um, present. And I, s <laughs> I know about what I speak. A month ago, I was on the mountain of Imider, which has now the longest sit-in and camp in the world, seven years, where villagers from Imider have taken over um, the hill next to the village because it looks into the valley up until the other side of the valley where there is a big mining silver industry. The problem with that mine is that it's one, owned by the king, and two, and that's their, mo their, their only problem, their main problem, is that the mine is basically taking all the water from the region. Because to get to the silver, it needs a lot of water, and it's drilling very deep. It can go, by law, up until 200 meters deep into the ground to use the aquifer um, water uh, underneath the soil. 
while the villagers, who have been living there for ages, if not for centuries, mostly Berbers, have only the right to uh, go 20 or at certain places 30 meters deep. So you can imagine what happened when a mine with a lot of industry is going 200 meters deep and the other side 20 meters deep, the mine just sucks away the water. So basically, the village and its surroundings, which was an oasis, basically, it's between Rashidiyah and what is that for the people who know Morocco, it's drying up. So they're bit by bit, bit by bit, they are dying. The village is dying because there is less and less water. And the picture that is shown here is actually, they went up onto the hill, not only to have the view on the mine, but also one of the pipelines, uh, water pipelines, um, is passing on that hill, and they have uh, put, uh, well, they have sabotaged it, uh, and they use the water for them. Now, what is interesting about authoritarianism as comparison, especially for the younger people who do not really know what authoritarianism is, as opposed to, for example, dictatorship, in a dictatorship, people would, you know, the army would go up and basically, you know, either take away or even kill if they wanted to, all the people. No, the Moroccan government lets these people on their mountain. And they just control the surroundings to see that it doesn't spill over and stuff like that. And the reason why I'm telling that is that the, I can, I think, go back very quickly to the first one. Um, how do you go back to the, oh, there, yeah. I don't know if you can see it. No, you can't, uh, too bad. Doesn't matter. Um, we went up that hill with 15 Moroccan students from Rabat and 15 Belgian students. It was part of a field student trip to learn them to do uh, field research, etc. And it was with Kuhn, by the way. Um, obviously, with 30 people climbing up that mountain, and it's a steep hill, as you can see, it took them, the local Qaid, about 10 minutes to call us. And he was very friendly. He was really nice, the Qaid. He said, look, you know, do we have an authorization? And of course, we told him we asked for all kinds of organizations signed by the dean of the University of Mohammed V in Rabat, which is not, you know, it's a big institution in Morocco. Uh, but obviously, uh, neither the interior uh, or another instance ever gave us an answer. And you know you're not going to get an answer. You know that you're going to be in a limbo, in an ambiguity. You don't hide, you don't lie, you go on a bus, you have all the names of the people who are present, you show all the paperwork, but you can't really show a real authorization that you can go up the mountain. And obviously you can say to that person, because like I said, he was really friendly, I said, why do I need permission to walk on a mountain in Morocco? What is so special about this mountain? Well, we cannot protect you. Eh? For your own safety, we're not sure that we can let you go up. And basically, he told us, look, you know, I know it's Saturday. You're not going to get to Saturday afternoon um, in an hour and a half uh, a stamp from the Ministry of Interior in Rabat. I tell you what. You make sure that the wali, the governor of the province, calls me. And if he says that you can be on the mountain, I will, I will even personally come and give you food tonight on the mountain. But I give you one hour and a half to do that. If not, I start the procedure to put you guys back on the plane to Belgium tonight. So that's the choice. You're there, we're 15 students, Belgians, 15 Moroccan students. The 15 Moroccan students were terrified. What happens to our future? Are we signed now? Do they have our names and our passports and this and that? The Belgian students, they don't really understand. They were like, well, what can happen? I said, well, you know, a lot of things can happen, but I don't think it will go that far. But then, of course, Kuhn, who does much more research than I do in Morocco, he was also thinking about his future of coming back to Morocco and being able to talk to all kinds of people. So at least the students had two hours or something like that, that they saw the camp, they, they shared food with uh, the local people and this and that, while Kuhn and I and, and one of our Moroccan uh, helpers uh, called but the last an hour and a half, we went back down the hill, the 30 of us. So uh, the, the point here was to show that it makes a difference. This in Tunisia now, 
I mean, they, they wouldn't have gone after foreigners in Jemna, for example, and told them, if you don't show me an authorization, you're going to get back on the plane to Belgium tonight. That wouldn't happen. So the opportunities today in Tunisia are wider and more widespread than in Morocco, where the uh, authoritarian reflexes are much more present. So, and here there's a little bit, uh, no, uh, yeah, because I, I went back. Um, a little bit of publicity of a new book that my colleague, uh, Kuhn Bohart, uh, just published his book, which, which is basically a reworked version of his PhD called Globalized Authoritarianism, in which, and it's, uh, it's basically the end, um, if you want to understand these, these type of conflicts that are growing, and these tensions between, on the one hand, these beautiful mega projects in the big, big cities and the more and more marginalized areas in the rest of the country, you have to basically look at three clusters of power. First of all, you have to look at the relations of power between the classes and class and the alliances between these countries. I know it's perhaps an old-fashioned concept in sociology to use the word class, but in, you know, for my part, you could use the word social group or whatever, but I think that most people would agree that when you look at the reality on the ground in these countries, you see a difference in uh, classes. You look at the relative autonomy of state and civil society, and the civil society you know, defined in its uh, broadest sense, because the more autonomy the state has, the more it can divorce itself, for example, from private interests, the more it has leverage to play as a broker. And, you know, that is something that in Tunisia is more or less happened. Yes, a lot of people who are now in the government are also part of the old elite families who are doing well, who were doing well, and who will keep on doing well as a family. But you see that the, the mix let's say, between the private interests of certain people uh, within the government and, um, and, and the private sector has changed. This in Morocco is, is quite different, where many ministers and the king himself are actually uh, some of the most important businessmen of the country. There's now, for example, in Morocco, an, a boycott campaign uh, 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 against, uh, for example, the Afrikiya, uh, the oil, of the, the, oil, oil eh? yeah, the milk and the water, yeah, the milk and the water, and all the products from uh, one person. And then, of course, you have to include also in your analysis the transnational and global power relations, of course, to have a good insight. So let me just conclude by saying that just like the wave of Arab uprisings and revolutions, these were not just a cry for more political freedoms. Today's multiple forms of social protest reflect also a yearning for more economic progress, redistributive justice, and sustainable development. Environmental um, mobilizations are also growing, and I think the, the case of Jemna and Imider are in part linked to sustainable development and resources and, and, and environmental justice. As long as debates focus on political institutions and elites, how important they might be, we will still miss the dynamics of real change that citizens throughout the regions are pushing for. And that real change is still in the social protest and types of collective mobilization that have been talked about. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Many thanks for uh, Mr. Sami for his excellent and interesting conference about uh, the neoliberal politics in Morocco and Tunisia. Uh, there are many issues to discuss in this uh, rich uh,